a titanic beast emerges from the shadows. It's 14 feet across and twice as tall, made of some gray goo from another dimension. It approaches, unwavered by your torch, unafraid of your polished blade. Your shining armor leaves it dauntless with reckless, monstrous hate. It approaches, slathering on inhuman jaws to taste the flesh of the monkey people who have invaded its home. What will you do? I'll, I'll hit it with a rock. A, a rock? But don't you see... This is a creature from antediluvian nightmare, a thing from beyond reason, a crawler in the crypt, a shadow in the darkness, and it is slavering for the very soul of you and your allies. <laughs> well, is there a rock nearby? Oh, bollocks. Welcome back to the RPG mainframe. Episode 52. I got the wah 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 wah. Uh. Episode 52. Uh, greetings, programs, and welcome back to the podcast that's made the light of the old RPG mainframe. It's Ingrid Bernal here, your host up in Upper Runeham area, the far reaches of the mountainous northwest, coming back at you to do some deep thinking on this glorious hobby of ours, which seems to be sweeping the earth in its influence and power. <laughs> but despite all that, there are moments in every single game which do not quite deliver all that they have dreamed of. Today on episode 52 of the RPG Mainframe, we are going to be talking about the dire and inevitable and interesting and hopefully very useful difference between qualia and narrative. Can, can we get some introduction music here? Because, you know, it's like for the timing. For, yeah, kick it. Yeah, that's dope. That's cool. That puts me in the mood to do some deep thinking, and that's what we're going to do together right about now. Here on uh, episode 52, first of all, thank you everybody for tuning in. Thanks for your ongoing support. There's a whole bunch of cyberpunk going on up in here this month, so that's why I've been a little bit quiet these past, uh, what, week and a half or so since the last episode. But remember, I am going to be putting up a blog post with all of my progress on Retune and Altered State. Going to be talking about how I'm building the Choose Your Own Adventure novel, um, sort of some of the creative foibles and uh, speed bumps we've been going through and uh, a bunch of the new art that I've been doing, which has been super challenging to try to stay innovative with it. But that is just the overall state of Runehammer. A lot of other surprises coming before the end of the year. So thank you, everybody, for your ongoing support. It, of course, means the world to me, and it makes this podcast possible. And this episode is about a key distinction, especially from a game master's point of view, that not only might help you look back on some of your games with a more comprehensive and more uh, critical eye that could be informative and illuminating, but also going forward, you can catch yourself falling into one or the other side with these two methods. And these methods that I want to talk about for episode 52 here on the RPG mainframe is the difference between qualia and narrative. Now, before we really get into the difference, before we get into why you even care about this bizarre topic and how it applies to game mastering, let's break down this obvious sort of tiny elephant in the room with this weird word, qualia. Now, if you're researching along with me as we're doing the podcast, you'll look this up and be instantly begin to find a series of fairly obtuse philosophical links and articles concerning the concept of qualia. Now, to put it shortly, Qualia is a word that refers to the very specific sensation that we get when we perceive things. And a perfect example of this to really put your head in the qualia space is the color red, or better yet, the taste of a taco. Now, even though all of us have a sort of low-level assumption that we are experiencing things in the same way as human beings in a real universe... 
There is, if you think hard about it, an actual, total, and impenetrable barrier of ever knowing what the color red looks like to someone else or what a taco tastes like to someone else. Now, we can describe these things in all kinds of different terms, but qualia refers to the very specific, unique, individual experience of perception or perceived things or sensations that is, by its very definition, out of reach of another person. There's no way for me to know what red looks like to you. There's no way to describe red without using colors in description of that color. And in turn, I don't know the qualia that you experience when seeing those other colors. So I find myself actually unable to deeply comprehend what a taco truly tastes like to you. Now I can tell you it's spicy and has lettuce. And of course, there's some nice cheese and oh my God, tacos. But the word qualia as uh, one philosopher put it, is a very unfamiliar word for probably the most familiar thing to us in our daily life, which is the exact quality of perception. So why do we even want to think about what qualia is? It's kind of like, so it's sort of how you feel when you perceive things, right? Yeah, that's a very simple way to put it. But it's off-limitness is a little bit important here. So on the other side of the topic that I'm proposing here is narrative. Now we're all painfully familiar with this word, especially as the hobby grows and expands. This word gets tossed around a lot. It generally means story progression, right? Narrative is verbal expansion of story components. It is interestingness. It also sort of implies continuity, right? A narrative is something that has a continuous feeling that can lead to more narrative or can lead to even to emotions or can lead to crescendos, climaxes, and so on and so forth. Narrative, though, for me, sort of excludes disjointed storytelling, like vignettes or, in some cases, poetry. Narrative, to me, implies continuity over time. Okay, so why am I proposing this goofball juxtaposition between qualia which is this weird philosopher concept about the exact sensations we have when we're perceiving. And narrative, which is an ongoing construction of story, especially through the use of continuity. Now, I, I really want to point out how important continuity is here. Continuity means that one event, when it occurs, you as the experiencer, <laughs> are completely in tune with things because it's continuous from previous events. So if a man slips on a banana peel, it stands to reason that the next part of the narrative is that he's going to fall on his butt. Likewise, if you reverse time a little bit, me tossing a banana peel out onto the sidewalk, there's continuity as another man approaches, looks up into the trees because it's a sunny day. Oh, you can see where this is going, right? And if he doesn't step on the banana peel, if in the next moment a car falls on him, that's not narrative because there's no continuity there. That is sort of absurdism, right? Continuity is you kind of have a sense for causality and how the narrative is going to unfold. And if there's continuity, a lot of those expectations are fulfilled. And this leads to the ah effect of narrative. So we see our two terms, and now I want to hit you with why we want to think about this dichotomy or duality. And it's because what I want you to do as a game master is make a clear choice for yourself which one you want to be your next piece of outcome. Now, as a game master, you're constantly confronted with your hopes and dreams being dashed upon the rocks of player freedom, right? And this is actually the topic for episode 53, is all about player freedom and agency. But for now, as a game master, you've always got really cool ideas. But every time that player freedom or player responses or unexpected social interactions come and foible up all your work, foible's not a verb, <laughs> mess up all your work, a lot of these expectations, anticipations, and dreams that you've had as a storyteller and as a designer, they, they vaporize, right? And they scramble or they, they kind of 
they fly out of control on you and not, you're not sure what you're working with by the end. And so as a way to mitigate some of this trouble, what I propose is a very clear understanding of when you're trying to evoke a qualia or a qualitative experience or when you're trying to evoke narrative or ensure narrative. And seeing this dichotomy gives you a clearer sense of what you're doing with your next session. There's the thesis of the episode. A clear sense of what you're going for between these two types of reaction to your work as a dungeon master, as a game master. A clear perception of it is going to give you better results as you create your next session. And a closer match of your intention to what actually happens at the table. Okay, so how do these two types of thinking or two desired outcomes to your work as a game master really break down? Let's go through them one by one like we always do here on the podcast, right? So qualia, a qualitative experience. Now, a lot of uh, movies recently have, for reasons I don't fully understand, been sort of opting for this side of experience. They're, they're wanting you to feel something. And especially, I think, horror has been swaying into this side. Now, some of my favorite horror films are all about narrative. They're all about the revelation of a deep mystery. They're all about how one thing seemed like it was this way, but it was actually this way. And, oh, and that's why the terror isn't what we thought it was. It's far worse. Or we thought this was the villain. This person was actually helping us. And this is the villain over here. I really enjoy that type of horror, narrative horror or mystery horror, thriller horror. But the kind of horror that goes for qualia is horror that uses jump scares. It's horror that uses very, very slow, single location dread that's slowly, slowly building. You're not going to get some kind of big mystery reveal in these types of films. What you're going to get is a very slowly increasing sensation of dread or hopefully if they getting what they want, sort of fear and thrills. They are very slowly dragging you down to where that you are feeling what they want you to feel. Now, there's a lot of other films that do this in opposition to a lot of narrative. They choose to create this qualitative experience rather than tell you about a, a bunch of events that happened. And this doesn't just work with horror. It can work with humor. It can work with anything. But it's an approach. And it gives the creator a sense of a target or a, a, what we used to call in the video game industry a razor, which is something that you cut your ideas with. And if your ideas sort of fit, you don't cut them. And if they don't fit, you cut them away and you have this sort of criteria by which to judge things and it helps you to be creative on a regular basis. So a lot of these sort of slow boil kind of feel films go for this sort of sensation. We want to draw you into a realm of sensation and make you feel what our creative vision is feeling. Now, the isolated nature of qualia and our exact perception of our own feelings and how it's a little bit off limits to each other makes this very difficult. Actually, when this is executed well, it can create a truly profound experience in the audience. And for this very reason, I would argue that qualitative or qualia type experiences are quite far out of reach for the RPG hobbyist. And a lot of times they're inadvertent. They happen because of player relationships. They happen because of emotional responses to unpredicted events. But to purposely evoke or create or cause qualitative sensory experiences in players in the tabletop RPG venue or tableau, <laughs> if you will, is extremely difficult. It's hard enough to do in movies. Now, in older times, decades ago, this was far easier to accomplish because audiences in general were less used to storytelling experiences that were media rich or that were immersive, right? And so you could get movies like The Shocker, which were really, really scary. But to us now, we see that movie and we're just like, you've got to be freaking kidding me. That is, this is not scary. Or you take something like Last House on the Left, the original one from the 60s. 
terrifying film. But if you watch that same film nowadays, it kind of just seems like some people in a suburb and there's like a mean guy with black gloves on. Like, what's the big deal? This is because we have told and seen and experienced so many amazing stories in the modern world that I, invoking this feeling is reserved for truly brilliant media creation and storytellers. Now, some of us at the game table, I'm definitely not one of them, <laughs> are brilliant enough to create this experience. But I think if you're turning down the road of wanting to get this qualitative experience in your players, like I want my pay players to actually be afraid or I want my players to actually feel sadness or actually feel struggle or hunger. If this is the road you're going down, bless you. But at the same time, there's a warning sign next to that road. This is going to be very difficult to do. You need to maximize the immersion. You need to be all in as the game master so that they feel comfortable letting themselves feel things. You need to be as transparent as possible about your qualitative experience so that theirs feels welcome and open. Very difficult to do. Your narrative needs to nail it. Your voices needs to be believable. Your table needs to not be distraction. Your lighting needs to be good. There needs to be the right smells, the right feelings. Some alcohol probably wouldn't hurt. <laughs> But the qualia route is difficult. Now, this doesn't mean don't do it. It just means when you find yourself wanting it to happen in your game, see it clearly, designate yourself as this is what I'm working on, and then bravely walk past that warning sign. And that's the qualia side. The other side is narrative. And this, just like the definition side of this talk, narrative in game mastering is far more familiar than qualia. Narrative is there are several events, such as there's a vampire who is slowly completing his transformation, hiding in a train car. And this vampire is going to run rampant through the players and through various NPCs until a small relic from, you know, Dr. Hanford's office is revealed, which drives the vampire crazy. And actually, it will send the vampire down into his subterranean lair, in which place, if the relic is taken, it can be used to either cure or destroy said vampire. Okay, I have a narrative going right here, and the narrative is continuous. Remember, that is key. This is pretty familiar territory for a game master, right? But what I'm asking is not that you understand what narrative is, but that you look at your practice as you're working on your next session and clearly give yourself this designation. I'm going to do this part of the session or this entire session with a sort of a more narrative feel. I'm not going to worry if people are really sort of feeling the sadness of uh, this young gentleman turning into a vampire. I'm more taking a more comic book approach. I want to get the panels in. I want to see these moments and I want players to see and feel these moments. Oh, what did I just do? I want them to feel the moments. Uh oh. Okay. Well, if I want a qualitative experience, maybe I can condense that in down into one moment in the session. One moment that's as scary and dreadful as I can muster as a GM. Okay, so let me make a note there on that. But the rest is moving through events. Do you see how my own inner monologue just gave me this dichotomy? But with the sort of layer of critical thinking added, I know when I'm doing one and when I'm doing the other. Because part of my thesis for this talk here on the old mainframe, is that if you're trying to do both or not knowing which you're doing, you won't do either one well. So I know you guys have felt this sensation before when you're not doing one thing or another and so you're doing both poorly. A fantastic example is texting and driving. If you're just texting, sitting on a park bench, you're slamming out messages, you're talking to like six different people, you got emojis kicking, right? You're killing this game. If you're just driving and you have a helmet on, with headphones and you're going 250 miles an hour on an oval track, you are killing it. You are completely focused. But if you are texting and driving, you are a danger to everyone out, out there. You're, in, you're an inconsiderate jerk and you're just a terrible person, basically. <laughs> but more importantly, for the sake of this talk, you're probably driving slowly. You're kind of hogging a lane. Maybe you're signaling poorly, you know, but you're also texting badly. Like your messages are too short. You're not checking your autocorrects, which are making you sound weird. <laughs> But if you choose which one you're doing, you will do it with skill and with effectiveness and get those results you're looking for. The hard part is knowing which one you're doing because this is far more nuanced and complex than texting and driving. This is creative endeavor. 
The creative endeavor is so complicated that even analyzing your own creative endeavor is in itself an endeavor. <laughs> and that's where this comprehension of what it is you're wanting out of your session can be so useful and so powerful for you because it's a way to mark what you're doing, to see it, and then to lean into it, as we say. <laughs> Again, it's sort of another sort of corporate creativity term is leaning into something. So, you know, I, I see a thing that's working or I see a thing that's matching up to our goals, our product goals or our, you know, what we want out of what we're creating this week. And if I see that matchup, I lean into it. I put more resources into it. I make more detail, more notes, more pictures to help me remember this cool idea that I'm having about this moment when the vampire looks at his own hand and his hand is elongating and the fingernails tear through the ends of the fingers. And then in one moment of pure inhuman horror, he can't help himself. He sucks the blood from out from under his brand new fingernails and licks his lips with sick satisfaction, realizing that the last bit of his humanity has just slipped away from him. Now, do you see that even when I was trying to execute that piece, I fumbled a little bit on my narrative. And even that tiny little fumble can pull you out of the qualitative experience. That's why that warning sign is there. It is really tough to pull people into a true mood, an authentic mood. But if I were to just say, okay, now that you've beaten the gang of outlaws and you hear the rattling of chains inside the train car, you look inside and see a man who is finishing his, his change into a vampire. And he looks at you with evil intention. That was the narrative form. I wasn't really worried about how much you felt. Uh, what was it? Mr. Hanford? <laughs> Mr. Hanford's transformation into a vampire. I wasn't really worried about it. I wanted to move on to the next thing, which is probably the battle, right? Or maybe a discussion with the vampire. Or maybe it jumps out or it, it turns into a bat and flies away to its lair, which is going to be our next section. And there's that continuity, right? A lot of people will think, well, when you confront vampires, they usually turn into a bat and they go hide in their lair. And that's probably what we're going to do. And so I'm going to say to my best friend in the group, I'm going to be like, I'm going to save your life when we go battle this vampire in this cave because you helped me back there, you know, when that thing jumped on me and, and I owe you one now. And you go to the cave and there's some danger and the, the character in question does indeed get pinned down. And then you jump forward and you help them and save them. These are all panels in a comic book that represent narrative specifically in the sense of being continuous. So you're looking at your creativity for your next session and you have this sense of which parts are qualitative, the cool little word qualia, and which parts are narrative and where they cross over, maybe make some hard choices about not being so qualitative in that spot or being not so narrative in that spot. So there's a little more feeling to the scene. Now, who knows what's going to happen because you're always going to have players coming in. And that brings me now to our sort of conclusion, which is this same set of theoretical tools and critical thinking tools and how they apply to an even more difficult moment, which is when you're not at the game table. Once you're at the game table, as long as the continuity is there, as long as everybody showed up and it's all fitting and working, the chemistry feels good and things are going well, whether you do qualitative or narrative or whatever may happen, it's going to be a great time anyway. <laughs> but there's something difficult to do that only the game master has to do next, which is face the between. The between of sessions. Session four is over. Session 44 is over. It's time for me to plan session 105, right? It's, it's time for me to plan the next session. Now, by plan, I have to be careful because the players are going to have some input here and going to be making some choices. And when I say the word plan, I also have to be careful because I want there to be continuity. So if at the end of session 44, the vampire has been killed with a stake through its heart, I don't want to be hurling a freshly healthy vampire at them at the beginning of session 45. That doesn't have that feeling of intuitive continuity. I also might be wary about taking them from the gr gruesome moment of having a stake through a vampire's heart. And then in the very next scene, they're sort of uh, in lawn chairs on an island resort. 
Now that is something I could explain as, story, as far as story goes, but the continuity is going to be difficult. And so I face these same problems again when I'm between sessions, except for one critical detail. It is almost impossible to develop qualia between sessions. Now, a lot of us use a chat channel, Facebook, Discord, whatever, to talk between sessions about character motivations, about ideas, or maybe we're talking about what happened last session, what we liked, or that cool thing that somebody did, or that moment when, you know, the dragon came crashing into the snow. There is talk between sessions, but I would argue that even though those can be very interesting and build a lot of the game, they very seldom, if, if ever, have a real sense of qualia to them, a qualitative feeling of emotion or hard-to-describe perceptive richness. The time between sessions is almost exclusively narrative. And so what this gives you as a game master is a clear delineation, I hope, of where to put some of your thinking as you conceive of your next session, it's narrative. And remember our definition, narrative is all about a thing being continuous. If at the end of session 44, someone threw a banana peel out on the sidewalk, I damn well better see that banana peel on the sidewalk at the beginning of session 45. I'm not sure that I get to really uh, move past somebody walking up and slip on the banana peel. Now in our chat channel, of course, we can talk about, yes, a, a man with a hat walks up, he steps on the banana peel and falls on his butt. Everybody laughs, stands up from the bench, and then we walk downtown. So now, as I plan session 45, my players are entering downtown. Now, even though there was a span there, which was not perfectly continuous, they may have walked for hours, conceptually speaking, that continuity held. And so where everyone's conversations left off, where everyone's motivations left off, where their sensations and perceptions of the game left off, they are still relevant. And this is going to limit how much you can plan in your next session. So you get to be purely narrative. But then the minute that next session starts, if you pass another three hours without just a little bit of qualitative moment, just a little bit of feels, you know, give me some feels in there. <laughs> then it can start to feel like the Silmarillion, right? Has anybody ever read that? That's uh, Tolkien's sort of world-building book. And it's notorious for being all narrative with almost no feels. It takes a historian's approach to storytelling, and it can be quite exhausting, even with the world's, well, one of the world's most preeminent writers, right? And so this is all educational to me as a game master, especially because I'm confronting a frankly terrifying new terrain, which is to try to make cyberpunk as fun and as rich and as intuitive for players as fantasy has been over the years. And in my experience, it never is. It's always much more gaggy and flimsy and sort of harder to imagine and looks kind of like a cheesy 80s movie in your mind. Whereas fantasy can have this really rich tapestry. Now, part of the thinking that's gone into the qualia narrative dichotomy, which I've been working on for about three weeks now, I have to send a shout out to my role for effort crew. So we've been going through a five session campaign with Jason at the helm and experiencing some incredible moments of elation and exciting battle, especially we did a dragon fight, which anytime there's a dragon battle that really works well, it's, it's super exciting. It's a bit of a holy grail moment when you're playing, right? But we've also had breaks in continuity that for me as a player were sort of difficult. And we just kept rocking on and we're just still doing our thing and we're all role playing our characters. But over time, I started thinking more and more about this in my own game master practice. Especially as I'm facing cyberpunk, I'm thinking to myself, well, this is a big world. Cyberpunk is a very big, big genre. And I want that sort of feeling of continuity. I want to learn from this, not just grind my teeth. But then also, you know, we had some real moments of like poignant sort of tragedy and excitement that were really real, that felt 
very memorable and very cool. We had those too. So I don't want to lose those either. How am I going to capture those in, in a, a genre that's so much more jokey and modern than fantasy? How am I going to do that? And so both what we were going through in our game and where I'm headed with my upcoming practice were both giving me this ish. And as I was looking at my notes, I'm like, this is kind of a big mess until I found this dichotomy. And I started seeing a session in more of a rhythm. There's a little bit of a qualitative part to get the feels together. And there is narrative progression that is continuous. And I started feeling better about dividing my notes into these and making sure that my sort of ideas for sessions, which will probably be scrambled up by player craziness, at least have this rhythmic thinking, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, so that you're sort of covering these pieces that make our hobby so dang fun at the table and so unique. So I hope you guys take as much insight from the dichotomy or the difference or the juxtaposition between qualia or qualitative experience and narrative experience. And it helps you in your ongoing and honestly never ending endeavor to master the art of game mastering and to master the art of planning and taking notes as a game master, which let's face it is a big part of it. Now, once you hit the table, all bets are off. Player control, player agency, player freedom, and most importantly, player response is such a huge factor and can sometimes be maddening, can really drive you crazy. But when there's a harmonic existence between player freedom and game master intent, well, it's one of the best things you can do on the planet. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next episode here on the RPG mainframe is player freedom and what you can do as a game master to both encourage and harness it so that you don't foobar all your cool plans. <laughs> because me, with some games coming up that I want to run, I don't want my plans to be foobarred. <laughs> but it happens an awful lot, doesn't it? And as a player, I can say, I've foobarred my share of GM plans. And if you haven't, I'm not sure you're playing the same hobby I am. <laughs> okay, you guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. It's really great to finally get these thoughts down into the podcast so I can kind of turn the page in my journal. You know, a lot of times the thought that goes into the podcast, it sort of, it starts to grow moss on it. And I'm like, I don't know if I really feel the words or if I have a full understanding yet where I can record this and I have all this self-doubt and I procrastinate. And I'm like, eh. But then I look around at the hobby at large. You know, I talk with my co-players and my, my homies online, of which you guys are many. And that confidence returns to take a concept that starts in the form of notes and to basically just, as I like to say, pull your pants down and run down the street. <laughs> in podcast form, of course. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. This is old Ingrid Burnall here on the RPG mainframe. Keep your eyes on social media and all that other good stuff as the craziness of Runehammer continues to unfold. Welcome new patrons, and most of all, thank you everybody for your ongoing support. Stay tuned for more craziness, and may your dice roll high. Strength, honor, and beer. I'll see you guys on the internet. I'm getting on out of here.